the single most common reaction when they leave the room is we are not as divided as we've been told. People have an exaggerated idea of how different the other side is. And just the simple act of informing people, here's what the other side actually believes about this, itself reduces polarization. The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. At the Village Square, we talk about politics, religion, and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to Village Squarecast. This is Vanessa Rouse. Thanks for joining us for A Defense of Truth with author Jonathan Rausch. Our founder and president, Liz Joyner, is here to introduce our special guest and our facilitator, and she'll also share why we feel this talk is so critical at this moment in time. We're thrilled to present this program in partnership with Florida Humanities during the Created Equal and Breathing Free podcast series. All right, let's get on with a defense of truth. Take it away, Liz. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Joyner, founder and president of the Village Square. On behalf of the Village Square and Florida Humanities, we're delighted you've joined us for a defense of truth a conversation with author Jonathan Rausch on his book, The Constitution of Knowledge, with facilitator Aaron Sherrickman, the executive director of PolitiFact. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome streaming partners, PolitiFact, USC Center for the Political Future, Center for the Humanities at University of Miami, Civil Squared, Common Ground Committee, Network for Responsible Public Policy, Citizen Connect, and our wonderful long-term partners, the Tallahassee Democrat and WFSU. Especially given tonight's topic, I wanna to give a shout out to local journalism, specifically the small but fierce teams at the Tallahassee Democrat and WFSU. If you want to do your part to support the constitution of knowledge and save democracy while you're at it, you'll subscribe or donate to a journalistic endeavor near you. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's very special guest, Jonathan Rausch, a senior fellow in governance studies at Brookings Institution and a contributing writer for The Atlantic, is the author of eight books, including The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth, uh, The Happiness Curve, Why Life Gets Better After 50, which I wouldn't know about, and Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought, and many articles on public policy, culture, and economics. He is the winner of the 2005 National Magazine Award for Columns and Commentary and the 2010 National Headliner Award for Magazine Columns, among other awards. Now, for my version of his bio, this is a man who has an uncanny ability to see what is essential about our civic health about 25 years before the rest of us do. As was true with his book, Kindly Inquisitors, written in 1993. The Constitution of Knowledge profoundly captures our challenge at hand. If we choose to not listen carefully, I think we risk losing everything. Ladies and gentlemen, the owner of one of my favorite brains on planet Earth, Jonathan <laughs> Rausch. Wow. Well, Liz, thank you. After that introduction, it's, it's all downhill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm betting not. I'm so pleased to be with you tonight, to be with you all tonight, to be a second time returnee to uh, the Village Square, I believe only the third person ever to have that honor. Uh, I hope uh, I hope after tonight, it won't become the, the last time I'm back. I think the format today is before Aaron comes on for a conversation, I just thought I would as succinctly as I could lay out the three big ideas in my book, The Constitution of Knowledge. It's, it's a big book, it's challenging, lots of moving parts. So I won't do justice to any of these three big ideas, but they will, I think, give you the flavor of the book and set up a a really interesting conversation. There's this new phrase being bandied about. You never even heard it three or four years ago. It's called epistemic crisis. You know, it's a strange term. What's, what is first epistemic? And second, what's a crisis about it? So epistemic is the philosopher's word for having to do with truth or knowledge, distinguishing truth from non-truth, which turns out to be a very hard thing to do. And what about the crisis part? 
people say we don't have shared facts. For example, uh, Barack Obama has said that, many others have, and that's true, but that's not a crisis because, of course, we constantly have disagreements over facts. Science Scientists have them all the time, and of course, Americans have them all the time. We've never agreed on everything. We wouldn't want to. Uh, we rely on diversity of viewpoint to actually find our mistakes. So what's crisis about it? Well, what crisis would be occurring when things reach a state where on at least critical matters of public policy, when unable to reach a common factual basis or more to the point, maybe more importantly, we lose the ability to agree on even the mechanism to settle our disagreements about facts. And this becomes a crisis if it begins interfering with our ability to self-govern ourselves as a people. Symptoms of this kind of situation would include things like extreme polarization, chilling where a lot of people are afraid to speak out, forking realities where increasingly you have two completely different accounts of truth and they're not able to talk to each other or communicate. Over time, this kind of crisis can lead to ungovernability. It can even lead to civil war. And we saw that in the United States the last time we had a big epistemic crisis in the 1850s. And as you all know, it, it didn't end well. Are, are we in such a crisis now? Uh, we're there or we're close to there. I'll just give you a couple of data points out of many. The first is that about two thirds of Republicans believe the 2020 election was stolen. It was not. That is factually incorrect. Uh, that is a view, however, which if 70% of a party believe it sets up a crisis because it says that basically the majority of one of our two major political parties doesn't think we live in a democracy anymore. Very, very dangerous situation. Second data point, about 60% of Americans, about 67% of college students say that they are unwilling to state their true political beliefs for fear of bad social consequences. One study that looked at this figured, you know, it's hard to say, but figured that's like four times the amount of self-censorship and chilling that was going on at the height of the McCarthy era. This is often goes by the name of cancel culture. When you see that kind of division, that kind of forking reality, that kind of chilling, we got a problem. So what to make of all this? Three big ideas. I'm going to put in front of you. I, I hope this is not going to be my Rick Perry moment. It hasn't happened yet. Big idea number one, it's not just a marketplace of ideas. It's a constitution of knowledge. Big idea number two, you're being manipulated. And big idea number three, they're not 10 feet tall. We are, at least if we play our cards right. Constitution of knowledge, what's that? In a nutshell, about the hardest thing for any social group, whether it's a small tribe or a large society to do, is agree on a common account of truth and how you get to truth and who has authority over truth. And the standard way of doing that over the millennia is that some priest or prince or potentate or a politburo or something else beginning with P basically decides what's true and what's false. You know, divine inspiration, right of kings, totalitarian ruler, and imposes that on society. And then the society fractures because some people don't want to believe that. And those people are oppressed or they go to war with each other. And these become oppressive, ignorant societies. This is a fundamental problem for humans. It is driven by some real cognitive vulnerabilities. We don't, in our everyday lives, it's not our job to search for truth. It's our job to make friends and have high social esteem. So we actually will double down on our errors in most cases if it's what our tribe or group is doing, and we'll follow them you know, down, down these crazy rabbit holes of beliefs. It's how you get the Soviet Union on a large scale or, or Jonestown on a small one. Around the same time, more or less, as the US Constitution was created, the Constitution of Knowledge was created. It's not a metaphor. It's not a simile, a figure of speech. It really is a thing. Now, it's not written down, and it doesn't have a Supreme Court. Neither is most of the U.S. constitutional order. But it is a constitution because it's a governing regime that gives us the structures we need so that we can interact in a way that produces knowledge, that converts conflict into facts, a miraculous thing when you think about it. The U.S. Constitution turns conflict into policy. 
it uses compromise. You can't get anything done if you don't compromise with other factions. The constitution of knowledge says, if you want to make a fact, if you want to put it in the newspaper, or if you want to put it in a textbook or teach it in a class, you're going to have to persuade other people who are not like yourself. In fact, they're no one in particular. You're going to have to persuade anyone who looks at it anywhere in the world, a very high bar. But that creates this vast social network in which people all over the world, literally millions and millions of professionals and institutions can contribute to checking each other's work and checking for each other's errors and holding themselves accountable to that. And that creates this enormous human hive mind that I call the reality-based community. It's not just, well, long pole in the tent, science, academia, universities, research, all of that. Just as important, however, number two is journalism, fact-based. Number three, law, also fact-based. If you don't believe that, ask Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani what happened when they tried to take fake facts about the election to court. And number four, government, which has to base policy on true facts, not stuff that's made up. So you get this global community of people searching for each other's errors, making mistakes, but finding them incredibly quickly. That's the real genius of science. And that's the hive mind that allows us to literally learn more as a species in a single morning every day than we did in our first 200,000 years. And that's what put the vaccine in my arm that's protecting me right now. So that's the constitution of knowledge. It's not just a marketplace of ideas. It's very structured. It needs lots of institutions and norms and rules and people who are willing to follow those rules. Stuff like be truthful, not just truthy. Uh, be willing to lose an argument at the end of the day and move on. Stuff like that. We can talk more about that if folks are interested. Big point number two, you're being manipulated. Constitution of knowledge has always had not just critics, but antagonists and enemies for all kinds of reasons, going back to the age of Galileo. In 1993, I wrote my first book about this and identified some of those, some of those adversaries back then. It was called Kindly Inquisitors. I wrote this book because 2016, 17, in that period, I was seeing the emergence of some really pretty powerful and sophisticated antagonists. Um, there's, there's, a, there's several that we need to talk about, but uh, I'll, focus, I'll focus for now on two. The first is disinformation or propaganda or what's often called information warfare or what I call epistemic warfare. So this is about manipulating the social and media and information environment for political advantage. Um, what you're trying to do is divide, disorient, confuse, uh, deceive, and ultimately demoralize your target population. This is what Vladimir Putin was trying to do and, and did do in the 2016 election cycle, you know, with that business where he would stimulate artificial artificially stimulate protests, real life protests, opposing protests across the street from each other and put out lots of fake stuff and conspiracy theories wherever he could. He's trying to demoralize, to deceive, to distract and divide us. Now, the next minute and a half or so are going to sound partisan. And some of you won't like that. Um, I am center right. I have respected, admired, and voted for many Republicans. What I'm saying now is just the situation as I see it. Uh, you may feel differently. And we can talk about that. I believe that Donald Trump and his MAGA movement are the most sophisticated, audacious, and successful disinformation operators since the 1930s. And by that, I mean that they have figured out how to adapt Russian style mass disinformation techniques like the so called fire hose of falsehood and apply them to US politics. What's the fire hose of falsehood? That's where you put out so many lies, exaggerations, half truths, and conspiracy theories through so many channels simultaneously that people can't keep up. The media goes nuts trying to knock these things down, but two come three come, a dozen come every time you knock one down. You repeat them again and again. So they soak into people's heads. The public becomes confused, disoriented. They no longer know who or what to believe because they're just hit with so many of these things all the time. This is why, according to PolitiFact, uh, in the 2016 campaign, 
Hillary Clinton was clocked in what she said as, uh, as mostly or entirely false 25% of the time, too high, but it meant she was mostly or entirely truthful 75% of the time. The numbers were flipped with Trump. 71% of the time, what he was saying was mostly or entirely false when it was checked. That's not coincidence. That is the deliberate pouring forth of lies. That's why in his inauguration, he lies about the weather. He lies about the crowd side, obviously checkable things. This is the putin esque strategy of just drowning people. As his advisor said, Stephen Bannon put it in a beautiful definition of this kind of disinformation, flood the zone with shit. This causes cynicism, disruption. People don't know what to believe. And ultimately, it leads to a situation where 70% of Republicans believe that the election was stolen. And a lot of other Americans, independents, for example, believe we'll never actually know who won the election. Second thing that's going on. Now, this is a tactic that's been weaponized as it happens primarily by the left, but it could have been by the right. It's just the way it works right now. But all of these tactics that I'm talking about can work for either side and have historically. And this one is what's known as cancel culture. So people discovered in the age of social media that they could create the false appearance of a consensus by doing things like what anti-vaxxers did. Uh, they manipulated search engines and bots and algorithms and celebrity endorsements to make it appear if you got online, like lots of scientists thought vaccines were dangerous. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is just put so much social pressure on people who dissent that they self-censor. They're worried about losing their jobs, their reputations, their professional connections, even their self-esteem if they're hit by one of these shaming campaigns. Overnight, of course, hundreds, literally thousands of people can jump all over you if you get out of line on college campuses. Happens all the time. Off college campuses, it happens all the time. This chills people. It turns them into their own policemen. They don't know what it's safe to say anymore. And that's deliberate. You never know the boundaries. They constantly shift. You never know what you'll get hit with. But you do know that the environment is treacherous if you speak out. And so you don't. This is a very old tactic. It was pointed out by Alexis de Tocqueville in 1835, who said it was the biggest threat to liberty in America. Social media have greatly accelerated because it's now, you know, snap of a finger, you can do this kind of thing. And this is what leads to a situation where 60% of Americans are afraid to speak out on certain key political topics. And a third of Americans across the board, from very conservative to very liberal, say that they don't speak out at, at work, that they are afraid of losing their job or professional job opportunities if they tell the truth about their political views bad situation if you believe in robust and open civic discourse as, as I do. Point number three, they're not 10 feet tall, we are. These are new tactics or new applications of old tactics, I should say. They are very sophisticated. They weaponize these cognitive vulnerabilities we have, like the more often we hear something, more likely we are to believe it, even though the two have nothing to do with each other. They are sophisticated. They are powerful. We have never seen the application of Russian-style mass disinformation in American politics. We were unready. We were taken by surprise. The bad news is that if we continue to be taken by surprise, if we don't understand and defend the constitution of knowledge, which is a lot of norms and institutions and rules that we have to follow and we have to protect, if we don't do that, we lose it. The good news is we are just starting to fight back, and there is a lot that can be done. We'll talk more about that in the, in the conversation that follows, but you know, you're never going to get rid of disinformation or social chilling um, in principle or in practice, but, but you can do things in three different dimensions. One is as institutions, and this is where Aaron, who we're going to be talking, comes in. What we did in the past in these crises, and we have had them ever since the printing press, is create these buffers and incentives in the form of institutions and guardrails in people's lives so that they got better at using these new media. They got more resistant and resilient, and that's what you're looking for. Uh, one example of that is Facebook's new oversight board, and another is the International Association of Fact Checkers, in which PolitiFact has been a leader. Uh, and there are many other examples. The second is the individual level. That's what we can do. Where most of us on this, on this webinar are part of an institution, which is truth-seeking or truth-based 
or needs to be truth friendly? What can we do in an environment? There's, there's always something. We can be a reality ally by speaking up and, and saying things that are true, even if the consensus is to go down some rabbit hole. Um, don't retreat that, that nonsense tweet that may be amusing, but is going to go viral. If you see a cancel campaign going on, don't join it and stick up for the person who's being targeted. They Actually, those campaigns can be stopped pretty quickly if people push back. If you're an employer, don't fire someone who's, who's being canceled. So at the individual level, you know, just also get smarter about how we consume media. Some of that's happening as well. And then finally, a third dimension, which is so relevant to Village Square, and that's civic institutions. It's important to understand Propagandization and polarization go hand in hand. They're almost two sides of the same coin. Propaganda intends to divide the target population and thus weaken it, create room for demagogues or dictators or outside forces to play havoc. So they're dividing the society. And the more divided the society is, the more susceptible it is to the kind of propaganda that says you have to hate on the other side. They are a risk to you. So these things feed each other. You get a negative spiral. This is what Putin's trying to do. Uh, the more polarized we become, the easier we are to be propagandized. The more vulnerable, the more we're propagandized, the more polarized we become. How do you fix that? Well, you begin rebuilding the core of the civic institutions that connect us as human beings and make us less susceptible to thinking that the other side are demons. One example of that is a group called Braver Angels, which I'm associated with. I hope you'll all check it out, braverangels.org. Another, of course, is Village Square. But every time we build back some of those civic bonds that connect us to each other and build a little bit more trust in each other, we reduce the ability of Vladimir Putin or any other actor who's trying to weaponize our vulnerabilities against us. So, that's why I'm a big supporter of, of Liz Joyner and Village Square and thank the sponsors who've made tonight possible. And now for conversation with Aaron. So, John, I'm, I'm going to ask you one question before I introduce Aaron and just make a comment. It's been just like a very weird experience to spend 15 years in close proximity to people who feel uh, very politically different than I do. And what it's done is it's made it so I am so clear on my confirmation biases at this point that I always seek someone to disconfirm me. You know, what am, what am I thinking here? Be the queen's loyal opposition here. What am I missing? Um, and I've kind of come to believe that I think one of our biggest challenges is, is just that we kind of don't, all of us have a human being to operate and we don't really have a very good operator's manual. It seems like we don't really get ourselves very well. And as a result, we don't really get what happens when when our confirmation bias, our conformity biases scale up to a huge society that has to figure things out. Um, so I guess I just wanted to make that observation and just see if you had any thoughts about that. You obviously spend a fair amount of time in the book talking about both human nature and the history of resolving conflicts in a horrible way that, you know, I mean, we don't really realize what we have, what we might go back to if we don't maintain the constitution of knowledge. Well, leave it to Liz Joyner to ask an incredibly profound question. It goes to the heart of four centuries of political philosophy. So there are all kinds of reasons we can't really trust ourselves politically. We're way too certain. We are extremely partisan. We are very tribal. We do not want to compromise. The genius of the U.S. Constitution is it says, you know what? If we get the rules and incentives right, we can force people to compromise in their own self-interest. And that's why you have the division of powers, separation of powers, the checks and balances, all the things that even if we don't want to talk to the other side and compromise, we're going to have to most of the time. And that creates a social dynamic where we learn to interact with each other in a constructive way. So the key there is you have rules and institutions that bring out, help us be our better selves. Exactly the same thing is true of the Constitution of Knowledge. This is why I say it is not a metaphor. It's doing the same thing as the U.S. Constitution. We all believe we know the truth. We are right. You are wrong. We all have basic cognitive bias to not only seek out, but actually mentally, perceptually register the things that we agree with and that raise our status. Getting people to try to actually debunk the things that they believe, look for errors, which is the only way to learn is very difficult because that's the last thing we're inclined to do. 
So what do you do? You create a whole bunch of norms and institutions, places like the newsroom that I came up in, which says, you know what, like it or not, you're going to have to check your facts. And that's how you'll advance in the world. If you get enough stuff right and you pass enough of these things, then you've made knowledge. You've got a story that other people will follow. If you're an academic, you'll get footnoted. If you're really great, you'll get a Nobel Prize. But all of these systems are designed to force us out of those tribal grooves, those, those inner, that kind of state of nature, cognitive vulnerabilities, and make us re relate to each other so that we can help each other learn. And that's the constitution of knowledge. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to introduce Aaron Sharakman, the executive director of Glitifact, based at the Pointer Institute of Media Studies in St. Petersburg, Florida. Aaron leads the growth and development of Glitifact, manages its outreach and partnerships, and oversees new initiatives and product development. Aaron also oversees Pointer's Media Wise initiative, which aims to empower people of all ages to be more critical consumers of content online. Aaron has been with Politifact as a writer and editor since 2010, after seven years covering government and politics for the Tampa Bay Times. I'd add that Politifact and Pointer Institute are important parts of the constitution of knowledge. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you, Liz. It's great to be here. Great to be with you, Jonathan. You know, I want to pick up on uh, something that just strikes me. Uh, we have 200 people here watching. I would assume all 200 people by their attendance are part of the reality-based community that you talk in the book. Kind of like by being here, I think that they want to be here. And I want to also use the number you said, which was 70% of Republicans thought Trump won the election. I would posit to you that a fair number of those people think they are also in the reality-based community. And so I, I maybe want to start with kind of a big question, which is something Liz picked up on, and I think is kind of like a problem that I think a lot of people just have, is they think they're in the constitution of knowledge, but they're believing things that are demonstrably false. And how, as a society, do we begin to deal with it and like kind of pick those pieces back up and kind of push us forward rather than in this kind of feedback loop that we too often see. So it's a common and constant issue. Many people, 25% of Americans believe in astrology and they think it's true, right? 40% uh, believe in demonic possession. Usually, if we're talking about people living their own lives, they're pretty good at managing these beliefs and integrating them into our lives. I'm an atheist, so I think a lot of the things that Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Mormons believe are really strange beliefs that are out of touch with reality, even though they think they're true. Mm -hmm. So normally, actually, this is just part of the process of, of interacting um, and the freedom to believe, and that's important. Where it becomes a problem is where you get these alternative realities that interfere with self-government in fundamental ways. And one of those is when things that are demonstrably false about the election become accepted and by a large share of a population. Another kind of problem is if a large share of the population becomes convinced that uh, vaccines have microchips. And a lot of this is, you know, Aaron, this is why your work is so important is about rebuilding trust in the institutions of the core reality-based community. And that's, as we said, that's science, academics, and research, but it's also journalism. Trust has declined massively. And I'm a journalist by profession, not an academic. Um, we've got a real trust problem. Some of that's not our fault, but some of it is. Law is doing a bit better. And, uh, and then we got social media to contend with. So a lot of the work that has to be done is for people like you and me to figure out how to rebuild that trust. I think fact-checking is, is part of that solution, but that's, that's where we've got to go. Let's, I want to talk about fact-checking, but I want to talk about journalism a little more broadly first. You talk to people, you ask people about their thoughts on journalism. I think the prevailing thought wisdom is, I wish it was the way it was in the old days, right? In the 50s and 60s. The internet has created this uh, 
really diversified what it is to be a journalist. Anyone really with a phone or an internet connection can be a journalist. That has created, I think, all kinds of issues and problems for the industry. Uh, because frankly, you have lots of people claiming to be a journalist. So I would say, no, they are not. Say a few words about that. And also, I guess, with a, a focus on you know, how, how as a member of the public who has limited time gets their news from Facebook or YouTube or a Facebook group, how, are, how can even the institutions of journalism support the constitution of knowledge when we don't know even how to define a journalist really anymore today? I think it's like a fundamental struggle for my business. So actually, I, I think I would say that we do know how to define a journalist. Um, and those would be people who still adhere to the principles laid out by the American Society of Newspaper Editors, now called the, what is it, the News Association? They've changed their name. Mm -hmm. But they put out guidelines and standards for journalism in the early 20th century. And those were picked up by journalism schools and as professional norms and standards and prize givers. And they inculcated things we took for granted. Like, if you write something about Aaron Sharrockman, uh, check it with him if you can. Be accurate. Run corrections. Someone had to come up with this stuff. It didn't just pre-exist. And in fact, the 19th century in America was a swamp of extreme partisanship and fake news. So I think the people who adhere to all those things are pretty much journalists. And there's a lot of people who don't. You know, They will make stuff up and put it online. They will skip important steps like editing like fact checking. And so I think actually we can define a journalist. So there's a couple problems. This is a long conversation, but an important conversation. One is the merger of fact and opinion for a bunch of reasons. Um, another is kind of a fundamental problem to everything else, including fact-based journalism. And that's the collapse of the business model because it's just so expensive to be part of the reality-based community. You've got to have editors and fact checkers and copy desks. The great, I believe, the magic technology, the secret sauce of journalism is this technology called the editor. That's the person who allocates the resources, decides what's important and not important, trains the journalists, screens their facts. Are you sure? Have you checked this? Have you checked it again? Well, those people are very expensive to support. So part of what we just need to do is start figuring out, and this is, this is a wicked hard problem, Aaron, as you know, but start figuring out if there are ways to begin rebuilding the infrastructure of reality-based journalism. And, and, and create clear differences between that journalism and, you know, Breitbart or Infowars, guys who are essentially peddlers of purposeful misinformation. Yeah, or, or at least help people understand the difference. People are going to make up their own minds and of course they should. And if you know if you're a hardcore Fox News watcher who believes that the the January 6th riot was an FBI plot, you know, you're not probably going to be talked about that by anything the New York Times said. But but doing what Liz Joyner was talking about, for example, triangulating, make sure making sure to use multiple sources. Looking at where the information's coming from. Is it well sourced? What do the fact checkers say about it? Are the fact checkers showing their work? By learning these habits, I think we ourselves and our kids can become better at um, understanding the boundaries of reality based journalism. I need to ask as, as a fact checker, a professional fact checker, uh, by the way, a job that when I went to journalism school didn't exist and I never thought I would do this, would be my output. You know, two big pieces of criticism I think that we get. One is who fact checks us, and two, ah, your work actually has doesn't work, right? And lots of folks will say, by the work we do, you're amplifying uh, falsehoods and and actually potentially even uh, deepening false beliefs. I guess I'm curious from your perspective. You can give me some advice now, as a professional fact checker who is trying to get it right and publish that information for anyone. Are we doing it okay? What can we do better? What is, how do we get better to participate in this reality-based community? Well, you should be answering that question, not just act, asking it, because I know that you guys are working hard at improving the fact-checking field. I don't know if people know this, 
But when I talk about building institutions to cope with the epistemic crisis, there were in the first decade of the 2000s, what, three or four fact-checking institutions? Mm -hmm. It starts with what, factcheck.org, I think, yep. and then PolitiFact comes along. That's Bill Adair, my high school classmate. Uh, and then one or two others. Mm -hmm. And then in the Trump era, and it's not just in the US, you see figures like Bolsonaro, du Duterte, uh, Orban, mm -hmm. uh, people all over the world, demagogues discover that they can manipulate the cognitive and epistemic environment by flooding it with fake news and conspiracy theories. And we see a huge growth in the fact-checking uh, network. So now there's, there's what, 300 or so? I, I lose count. All over the world. It's, it's hundreds, yes. Mm -hmm. Hundreds, yeah. It's somewhere on Pointer's website. There are hundreds. There are multiple languages. They're sharing information, which is important because it's much more efficient if only one place fact checks initially and others then can pick it up instead of doing it duplicatively. They're also working on international standards and norms for fact checkers. And that's really important because, of course, the public shouldn't believe something just because PolitiFact says it. Of course, it's possible for a PolitiFact journalist, like any other journalist, to be biased or, or blindsided or just, just conned. Those things can happen. But if you have some standards that, for example, require you to show your work, walk the reader through why you reach this conclusion, and it's all sourced, either footnoted or linked to other sources, and the fact checker comes clean about uncertainty, then even if the reader at the end doesn't agree with the fact checker's final assessment, whatever that may be, they'll understand how they got there and the process of thinking, and I think be better equipped to do more of that thinking themselves. So how to improve it? Uh, well, you, you tell me, you know, um, there's so much mistrust out there. The environment you're working in is so difficult. How would you answer the person who says, well, why should I trust you? You're just another part of the corrupt media establishment. Yeah. My answer would be exactly that we show all of our homework. So you can replicate our investigation. And if you find a hole in it, it's there for you to find a hole in it. It is the exact type of discussion uh, that you you talk about often in your book and wanted to happen in academic settings and any set, settings where people are always constantly iterating and, and discussing uh, a finding to make it better, reach a compromise. And I, I do think that's 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 the path forward with the one caveat that, you know, and, and uh, we won't dwell on Donald Trump. This isn't a book about Donald Trump. But he certainly has conditioned a group of voters in the United States to not trust institutions broadly. <laughs> uh, specifically, he's told them not to trust journalists. I'm curious when it comes to the to this book and the timing of it. Again, not a Trump book, but he's he can almost feel like his fingertips are on a lot of what we talk about. And I wonder if you can discuss a little bit about your decisions in in writing the book and where you wanted to include him, where you didn't. If there's anything you wish you would have included that you didn't now that uh, we're a little further into the future. Uh, take us through that. The book treats two challenges, maybe threats, to the constitution of knowledge as, as kind of co-equal. And those two are the two we've discussed. Uh, the one that's emanating predominantly from the right, which is the weaponized disinformation on a national scale, and the one that's at the moment emanating predominantly from the left. And that's the use of social coercion in order to, to chill people and distort their sense of the consensus, which actually works on what they actually believe. And then, you know, I would go back and forth with people, which one is worse? I don't know. Uh, I don't think that's true anymore. I had to write this book virtually all before uh, the January 6th riots and all that has transpired after the election. I did not know the extent to which the use of wholesale disinformation would actually outlast Donald Trump himself. I underestimated the extent to which it has become a standard operating procedure in the MAGA movement, which now essentially has control of the Republican Party. We see this, for example, in my home state. 
where they set up an entire alternative partisan audit to challenge the election results. Uh, oddly, the audit found that Biden won the state, which was surprising, but then it launched a whole new series of, of false claims. So knowing that, knowing that a major political party is not wedded to the basic values of trying to be truthful in politics, knowing that there are people out there in the House now, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example, who will say anything and often not back away from it, often double down on it. Now I don't see this as a Trump problem. I see this as a problem of a form of disinformation of epistemic warfare that has been released into US politics. And that's a problem because these are sophisticated weapons. And the really the only good way for a liberal democracy to deal with these weapons is not to deploy them in the first place. We had managed not to deploy them since the 1850s when there was a mass disinformation in the, in the South to gin up war fever. And, and that did not end well. And this won't end well if we don't get a handle on it. And no, it's not just about the person of Donald Trump. And yeah, just to add, to go directly to your question, something I would do differently now is I would not treat these two challenges as co-equal. I think that uh, the problems that we see in cancel culture and, and other forms of what's going on in the left are more like a cancer, whereas what's going on with the MAGA world and the Republican Party is more like a heart attack because we could see these tactics deployed in an unprecedented scale in 2024. And, and I guess the worry is the uh, tactics deployed plus what you would call resistance from the progressive left. I mean, we could, you know, we talk about this and we see this in other places in the world. We saw this on January 6th. Misinformation in words and, and WhatsApp groups and Facebook posts could lead to actual real violence. And uh, I mean, and those threats yes. are real. And I think is something that I think we all need to be mindful of. And I think it really speaks to how we start to rebuild those conversations to hopefully begin to avoid that. And But it's going to take some adults. It will. <laughs> you know, something that encourages me a bit, I think, is I think we're starting to see an awakening going on. I think people, liberals, smaller liberals, not progressives, but people who believe in liberal democracy, things like pluralism and the rule of law, on both the left and the right, are realizing that they're going to have to join forces to protect some of the core values like democracy and like truthfulness. And they've come to understand that you've got people both on the extreme right and the extreme left who are more interested in manipulating the system, manipulating our brains for political gain than they are in preserving the underlying fundamentals of, of our civic democracy. And I think we're starting to see more of those people come forward and get organized and start to push back, but it's still very early days. Uh, we're going to talk about cancel culture. Before we get to cancel culture, I want to do spend a little time on social media. So uh, for anyone who's read the book, I think, and, and you described this earlier, a, a lot of these tactics have existed for as long as we've been able to speak, but they feel supercharged because of the amplification measures presented by Facebook and Twitter. And so I, I first want to ask kind of a fundamental question and then kind of dig into it. I don't mean to put you on the kind of this or that. I know and I'm not trying to make gotcha questions. Um, but when we look at the crisis that we see, is this a crisis created by demagogic politicians, whether it's Bolsonaro, Duterte, Trump, whoever, or is it a crisis that is predominantly created by the social media platforms amplifying words and, and stories that wouldn't normally get the traction that they do. So something that's a challenge to me in presenting these ideas is kind of needing to have it both ways, or at least getting people to walk and chew gum. Um, on the one hand, it is unquestionably true that digital media, not just social media, but also, you know, Google search engines and all of that mm -hmm. digital media has been an accelerant on both sides. It has made it extremely easy to propagate mass disinformation. That used to be hard. Yep. You know, Russian agents used to actually have to go underwater and plant documents on submarines so that they could be found. 
Uh, you don't have to do that anyway. You just put out a tweet, right? Even, even, even 2007, 2008, it was a chain email, which at least limited to you to the number of people you yeah, physically had that's an email right. address for. <laughs> right. And then along comes the like button. And it's mm-hmm. just as simple as figuring out what's viral. And then off it goes. And Putin has, you know, these people at the Internet Research Agency who are like in their 20s who are doing this for a living, creating havoc around the world. So uh, digital media turns out to be tailor-made for disinformation. It also turns out to be tailor-made for canceling because, mm-hmm. you know, if I wanted to get you fired in the past, I'd have to organize maybe a petition and circulate it or have f- people phone your employer. Well, again, now, you know, you get on a plane and eight hours later, you get off a plane and a thousand people have demonized you and your employer has fired you because you become a liability. Super easy. So there's no question that digital media has acted as an accelerant. That said, it's not the first time we've hit technology that has acted as an accelerant. The biggest example, maybe the least fortunate in some ways, is the printing press, which was a massive social disruption. Suddenly anyone could read, anyone could print. Ideas went around the world. The first thing that that was used for was massive fake news in the form of books alleging witchcraft, which caused the deaths of tens of thousands of people across Europe, Um, radio, TV. So we've seen these disruptions before. They are important. We've got to learn how to deal with them. We should have a conversation about how well they're being dealt with by Facebook and the others. But having said all that, Aaron, the reason that we need to walk and chew gum Social media is not the fundamental cause of what's going on here. These tactics are age old. Tocqueville described canceling in 1835. John Stuart Mill describes it in 1859. The disinformation kinds of tactics, propaganda, those go back at least to the time of Lenin. That's what, 100 years now. So they've got these new accelerants, but we need to understand that the core tactics that are being used are old and we need to see through them. So we can't just focus on the bright, shiny object. An important point that I learned from, among others, Bill Adair, founder of PolitiFact, it looks like social media is not the number one spreader of fake news and disinformation. It's not even number two. Number two is cable news. Number one, and well ahead of the other two, is politicians. The oldest fashion form of social amplification out there. If a politician says something, a major politician, you got to cover it, right? And that's still the primary way that, that, for example, a figure like Donald Trump worked. So we can't think that Facebook is going to solve this for us. It won't. It can't. It's interesting. I agree. I think that they are, it is clear though, however, I think to a lot of people, they are the target. That maybe it's if we get them, if we figure that out, you know, uh, younger people are saying don't be on Facebook at all. Older, older people are maybe saying Facebook is censoring my content. It's a company that is in the crosshairs in particular. You know, uh, Twitter, another one. I think it's interesting. I'll, I'll just give you my take <laughs> uh, since I have the mic. Is, uh, I find Twitter actually to be far worse because of, and you described this in the book so well this culture of people who are not adding to the constitution of knowledge, but are like, you, you could say it better than me, one line comics who are out there to make their friends happy or say something pithy, but it creates this kind of, uh, especially in cancel culture, right? It creates this kind of pressure that falls on the weight of the victim of the tweet. I find it all very difficult and challenging. And, and personally, what it does to me is it means I stay out of the conversation. So I am probably on the 60% of the people who say they don't want to take part of it because it's like, ah, you know, and I, I assume that's probably a lot of folks on this call too. Yeah, I'm not a big user of, of social media. Uh, psychologists tell us that we shouldn't be all that surprised at what's going on here because when you put people in super unstructured environments, We imagine in our brains, the marketplace of ideas will sort out the good ideas. They'll rise to the top. We'll have critical conversations. That's not what we do at all. Without all the structures and norms that channel us in the constitution of knowledge, we don't do what psychologists call communicating with each other. We do what psychologists call displaying to each other, which means I get on social media 
to show my friends that I am a loyal group, member of the group, and increase my status by denouncing that common enemy, that horrible, outrageous person, Aaron Sharakman. Mm -hmm. So I do that, and then 10 other people see me do it, and they say, well, I better join in because I'll lose status if I don't show that I'm on board with this. And you see these bandwagons that can develop in minutes of denunciation as people pile in. This has nothing to do with critical communication, search for ideas, search for truth. This has everything about signaling to other people in your peer group, your status and your loyalty. These are fundamental human characteristics, and it took about 200,000 years to get past them. And now we've got a new medium where they've been unleashed again, and we're back to figuring out how to get past them. Sometimes. I think maybe I'll ask two more questions, and then we'll bring in Liz to do some audience questions, because I want to make sure that we use the time to get to your questions as well. I want to talk about cancel culture, particularly on university campuses for a little bit. And I'm going to channel of what I think the internet sounds like. So that's the collective Twitter, Twitter collective. And I think it'll go something like this. Ah, Jonathan, universities are always liberal. Like, what are you talking about? Like, uh, that's just the way it is. Like, you know, live with it, deal with it. What is this cancel culture about? It's just kind of, isn't it just what we're used to? So I want you to react to me, me talking like the internet, that like (laughs) cancel culture on the universities. It's just, isn't this just the liberal institutions that, It has always been? I think the answer is no. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Softball question, because you knew that was the answer I was going to give. (laughs) First is. It's true. Fair. (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted to do my internet voice. Sorry. (laughs) Universities for many years have been somewhat left of center, but there's now ample evidence. I can give you all chapter and verse if you want to see it, that they become significantly more politically monotonal over the last 20 years. So they're now entire fields like um, social anthropology in which academics can go through their entire career and never really encounter a conservative. And that is really bad for science because it means a lot of, a lot of assumptions on the left are not getting challenged and questioned, which means that errors are not being found, which means that knowledge is not happening. So you've got a change in campuses. They're significantly more left-leaning than they used to be. You have overt discrimination now as a result of that, uh, sometimes uh, unintentional, but sometimes intentional, where uh, 20, according to a recent study, 20% of academics in, in a lot of fields, especially grad students, are willing to just say they want, they'll discriminate against conservatives in hiring and uh, grant making and so on. So campuses have become more monolithically left-wing. And then the second thing that happened is what we referred to earlier. It used to be pretty hard when I was in college to have a weaponized attack on someone because you'd have to organize it. It'd be pretty hard to do. You couldn't count on lots of people to join in. Now that was 40 years ago. Today, as we've seen, it is trivially easy to use social media to pile someone on campus, but you have a bunch of other mechanisms too. Like you can weaponize course evaluations for professors. You can demand investigations of people because of what they say and generally get them. You now have campus bureaucracies and human resources and diversity, equity, and inclusion and student life that are quick to investigate all of these things. You now have a consumer driven culture in which if a student complains that they're endangered, for example, The university will frequently tie itself in knots to quote unquote protect them, which will often mean silencing someone they don't want to hear from. So all of those things, plus social media, plus the movement left have created an environment, which I think is less conducive to open debate and discussion. That said, I am not one of those people who just bash universities as places that are just swarming with crazy Marxists who are indoctrinating students. I don't think that's true at all. I think there are vast, vast reserves of integrity in the academic world. And that's what happened. It's a, it's a numerical minority of people on campus, of, of loud and organized and efficient, effective activists who are using these tools and these weapons to intimidate the larger group. 
but you've still got large numbers of people on American campuses, students and faculty who want to get it right, who are there to learn, to have the criticism, to debate the hard issues. And the question before us, all of us, is can we mobilize and empower those people to reinstate the values of the Constitution of Knowledge on their campuses? I want to, this will be my last question in this round. So staying on this topic, how would you define or help anyone in the audience define when they might be canceling someone versus when there might be a serious or real threat? Again, I started with the same place I started with the Republicans who believe Trump won the election. My my belief is that the people who would pursue a cancel culture strategy are doing it from a place of we're trying to do good. You know, we see imminent real threat harm. And so I wonder as you think about it, what is what are kind of the dividing points or the questions that someone should be asking themselves when you know when they say, is it right to cancel this person or not? <laughs> well yeah, you 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 came to the right place, Aaron. Uh, you mentioned this challenge earlier. I was the signer of the now well-known Harper's letter, which was people primarily from from the left and the center left saying cancel culture is a real problem. We need to pay attention to it. And a big response to that was, as you alluded to earlier, people said, well, there's, it's really just privileged white, mostly men who are for the first time being held accountable for what they say and they don't like it. So they call it canceling, but it's just criticism and it's fine. So when I wrote this book, I took that critique very seriously. Uh, And I said, okay, so what are the differences between critical culture and cancel culture. And it turns out there are a lot of them. And in the book, did I mention I have this book and it's available at fine bookstores everywhere? Um, You will find my diagnostic list of like the seven symptoms that you're being canceled. And no, no one of them does the trick. But if you have two, three, four, the more you have, the more sure you can be that what you're seeing is canceling, which is totally different than criticism. Criticism is about a good faith effort to criticize ideas rather than people in order to find truth. Canceling is about manipulating the social environment to isolate and intimidate your opponent. So I, because I don't want to have a Rick Perry moment, I won't try to list all seven. But these are things like, is this a campaign that's being organized and targeted? If I'm going around saying, everyone go after Aaron Sharrockman, he's a bad actor. That's verboten. In a critical culture, you can't organize campaigns against people. Second, are they punitive in nature? Am I trying to hurt you to take your job away, to demolish your professional corrections? In a critical culture, you target people's hypotheses rather than people themselves. That's the great breakthrough Mm -hmm. of a scientific culture. We kill our hypotheses instead of each other. Well, cancel culture is about demolishing the person. Are they lying about you? Are they taking what you wrote? completely out of context. Uh, That's a standard tactic in cancel culture, totally forbidden in a critical culture. Are they using character assassination? Are they, instead of looking at the sum of your career and saying, okay, he tweeted this one thing, which I don't like, but look at all this other stuff. Are they deliberately narrowing the scope to just that one word, potentially, in that one tweet and saying, this makes you a wretched human being who's deserved, who should be shunned by polite society? And then a big one, a, a, a strong revelation, secondary boycotts, not just going after Aaron Sharat, but going after your friends and associates. So if you speak up for him, if you take his side, you're next. Mm-hmm. That never happens in critical culture, um, or it should never happen, but it happens all the time in cancel culture. And there are two more. And the point I'm making here is that in practice, it's actually usually very easy to tell the difference. Yep, I agree. Uh, Liz, let's bring you in. I know the audience has been pumping in some questions, so I wanna make sure we get to hear a little bit from them. So what do we got, Liz? Excellent, thank you guys for a great discussion so far. While I'm getting to the questions, I wanted to make an observation, and that is one of the things that I think is so important about this discussion is that these two problems to from what we've seen are in dynamic, 
uh, sort of the laws of physics with each other, right? The equal and opposite reactions that are then escalating one to the other to the other. And so often those of us who are particularly concerned with one side of the equation aren't taking in the other side of the equation at all to to be able to understand that opposite reaction. So one example I have is that years back, we had Phyllis Schlafly's niece, Suzanne Venker, for a program on women's issues. And we had a whole big panel, lots of political diversity. Uh, Suzanne was politically conservative. And I think that that was my first experience sort of seeing what this cancellation looks like. And it, it felt really hard. And I see it over and over again in our work. It's hard Liberals make it hard for conservatives to be in the public square Mm -hmm. and to talk about what they're concerned about. And they made it hard for Suzanne that night. And it was very uncomfortable for me because we're her host. And, you know, if you do that, then you're not in contact with each other. You're not having that opportunity to disconfirm, but also see people's humanity. And then it escalates. And so if that happens, then you're more vulnerable to being taken advantage of by someone who wants to give you disinformation. Thoughts? Have you all seen the same thing? It's true. Yeah, it's a, it's a very common dynamic. And it's one reason why I mentioned something we can all do in these situations is if so, if I see Aaron being, uh, being targeted by activists who say, this guy's, I don't know, we'll call you a homophobe because I'm gay. So this guy's a homophobe. He doesn't belong in polite society piling on PolitiFact to fire him, our instinct will be to dive under the furniture, stay far away from Aaron, and hope that we don't get targeted next. It's a very common dynamic, which allows small groups of people to manipulate the situation because the majority disappears. And that's why it's so important that individuals step forward and say, I may disagree with Aaron on this point, uh, but he needs to be heard. And I'm going to help him be heard. And it actually doesn't take that many people telling the counselors to go jump off a bridge, metaphorically, before you can reverse that cycle. An example of that was at University of Chicago. Uh, A scholar wrote an article that was controversial because it said admissions should basically he wrote something against affirmative action and the usual suspects, like if you know, several hundred grad students demanded that he be investigated because he had created an unsafe environment and was a racist and all that. And normally at universities, what then happens is an investigation. And even if the person is clear, their their reputation is damaged and it's a horrible thing to have to go through. Well, in that case, Robert Zimmer, the president of the University of Chicago, put out a one paragraph statement, which I can only paraphrase, but basically said, here at the University of Chicago, we're in favor of free speech, professor so-and-so, Uh, Dorian Abbott was his name, was engaged in free speech. So there's nothing here to investigate. End of statement. Well, the result of that, as you all know, is the alumni went on strike, funding to the university dried up, the students all all also went on strike, and eventually the campus burned to the ground. I'm being sardonic, of course. What actually happened was nothing, absolutely nothing, because the would-be cancelers saw that they did not have a soft target. And they went away and tried something similar at MIT, where it worked. Mm -hmm. They got a Dorian Abbott lecture canceled. But so if we stand up to them, if we resist them, if we say going in, we're creating a climate for robust debate. And we, regardless of which side of the debate we're on, we will defend that. That makes a real difference, I think. So that's a great setup for the audience question that I was going to ask you first. And I'm going to read a little blip from your book first as a way of introduction. I wrote this down because I just thought it sounded so great. And I, and I thought, hmm, what if we all wrote this on every uh, canceling, horrible tweet that it was ever out there? It says, when I join others in shaming campaign against you and bomb your Twitter account, my tweets may take the form of communications to you. But in fact, they are about you and especially about me. What I'm really trying is is try to impress my peer group with my virtue, cleverness and loyalty by joining the shaming campaign. And better yet, by leading it, I can raise my status. You have the misfortune of being a useful object in my quest. It's a book club and you're the book. And so the question is, I, I just love that because it just seemed like it just put it put it right where it actually is. I think actually, in fairness, that's a quote from someone else. Oh, is it? I, oh. That I used. Yeah, I think so. But but yeah, it's you went in either and out. way. Whoever said it, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the question is, as an example, this seminar is called a defense of truth. What stops us from calling it an offensive against the lies? I understand that's a bit of hyperbole, but that's my general point. So, you know, maybe we we sort of don't, there's not enough of a counter offense where, where we fight back against it. Uh, who should take a first stab at that? Whoever wishes to. <laughs> I'll, I'll simply say, from my perspective, uh, we I, actually, it's funny, this is just inside my little world, We're talking today about what we do at PolitiFact. And what we do at PolitiFact is what we would call typing, Hmm. which means we get a claim, we say it's false, we present it to you, you read the claim, you say it's false, you know that claim is false. And I think that would be the offensive against lies or whatever. But I think while that's important, I I would argue that what's actually more critical is teaching or teaming which is to say, we are going to give you enterprise capability building so you can eliminate us as a fact checker because you will be able to do it yourself. And so I I kind of, maybe that's the positive way to look at it, but I think the defense of truth is the uh, thinking about how we as a society can build off the work of institutions uh, so that we all are in a better place of having those conversations rather than solely rely on, in this case, the fact checker. That would be my my take. Yeah. So that's that's actually a wonderful down to earth and better way of saying what I was about to say, which is, of course, I do believe in taking the offense, offensive, I guess, against lies. And that's what journalists try to do. But I don't like to frame it that way because who is really the enemy here? The enemy is ourselves. It's me. It's Aaron. It's Liz. We are all cognitively flawed as human beings. We are all too certain that we are right. We are all too quick to assume that the other side is actually lying when maybe they're mistaken or maybe we're wrong and they're right. So if all we're doing is looking for liars, evil people who are saying bad things on purpose, we'll miss the point, which is the whole point of the constitution of knowledge is to discipline ourselves so that we have to do the hard work of checking the facts, doing the research, understanding the mistakes that we ourselves are making. And that's the real line that we're trying to hold. Yeah, that's great. Liz, you want to tee up another one? Yeah, let's see. You mentioned that you find it sad that quite a few people in the workplace feel uncomfortable telling the truth about political affiliations. You also said that employers have a responsibility to not fire those who are trying to be canceled. Do you think there is any place for political discussion in the workplace? And if so, why? So one one employer did something interesting, got a lot of publicity. I don't I think it was, um, oh man, I can't remember the name. It'll come to me. And they banned political conversation in the workplace because it was becoming so, so divisive. I think it was, I think it was base camp, which is how we organized this program. Yeah. I think, it, <laughs> I think it was base camp and I'm fine with that. I'm fine with employers setting whatever rules for their, for their employees, create the kind of work environment that, that they need in order to flourish. What I had in mind was more the situation where outside activists demand the firing of an employee. This is, you know, a famous, a notorious case of this is David Shore, who is a left of center Democrat, actually, who tweeted out an accurate summary of a piece of academic research, summer of 2020. And this, some counselors decided this was an offense for reasons that aren't completely clear to me. And they went after him and called him a racist, and they went after his employer. One of them famously tweeted, come get your boy. And he was fired the next day. Um, lots of cases like this. Uh, an employee of uh, San Diego Gas and Electric was photographed you know, driving his car. He had his, dangling his hand out the window in, in this position, just, just you know, dangling it. And someone tweeted that out, claiming it was a white supremacist gesture, and he was fired the next day. So the kind of thing I have in mind is that there all the social pressure on employers right now is if someone's controversial, an employee, staff member, get rid of them because you know there's a hundred other people to take their place. Who needs the controversy? Well, we need to start getting employers not to do that. We need to create some social incentives to say, hey, that is not a good way to treat your employees. It is having bad negative cons- bad consequences for society. And there's actually a place called the Free Speech Union that was talking about working up a a voluntary code of conduct for employers that basically says, you know what, 
Uh, if it's off workplace and it doesn't affect the job you're working at the office, uh, we're not going to fire you. I want to I want to pick up here because one of the things that I want to make sure we're looking a little forward to. So we all know the Putin propaganda disinformation machine was very successful in 2016. We know that hasn't stopped. It has continued. I'm curious. Are you hopeful that either platforms or other groups, nonprofits, NGOs, 401c3s, whoever, are are making a big enough dent to have an impact by, say, our next presidential election or the midterms? Are we, are we, will we be able to get ourselves out of that particular hole, the, the Russian kind of disinformation campaign? Yeah, it's not just Russia, it's China, of course. Uh, there I can say, I think the answer is already yes. We were in 2020, we, meaning media, academia, government, corporations, including social media platforms, far more sophisticated and effective and effective at countering those tactics in 2020 than in 2016. Uh, we know that those foreign actors tried, and we know that they have a much harder time. The public is more aware of it. We now have agencies, nonprofits, places like the Stanford Internet Observatory, which are going into their networks and discovering what the memes and lies are going to be. They're then notifying the social media companies, and in some cases, the governments or the law enforcement agencies. A news media, far more sophisticated. You know, in 2016, it never occurred to people that this is all Russian propaganda, that, that WikiLeaks was basically a cutout for, for Russian intelligence. Now media organizations, the bigger ones, have correspondents who cover disinformation. They're doing a significantly better job, I think, of contextualizing these kinds of things. Hunter Biden's laptop led with not the laptop in many cases, but the very suspicious circumstances in which it surfaced looked exactly like a classic Russian disinformation drop. So media are more sophisticated, consumers more sophisticated. We are presenting a significantly harder target to the outside actors than we were even five years ago. We're still vulnerable, but we're doing better. Where I think we're not doing better is the domestic actors. And that's significantly, it's not only MAGA, it's also anti-vax, QAnon, which now becomes kind of a big flaming fireball of disinformation and misinformation. But I don't think we've still fully confronted the dimensions of the domestic attacks. And within that, not all, obviously, uh, of those domestic attacks are filtered through social media, though many are. I'm curious your take or your position when it comes to government efforts to increase regulation on social media companies like Facebook and Twitter. Two points. One, what should they be thinking about doing? And two, do you think it, something can get done in this polarized climate. I mean, it is interesting. Republicans and Democrats actually are generally agree that they want to regulate more for completely opposite reasons, which is funny. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Well, to repeat something I said earlier, to me, I have to walk and chew gum and say that on the one hand, digital media is a significant accelerant, but that on the other hand, it's not the core problem. I have yet to see a really persuasive account of what government regulation would look like. And I remind people that Donald Trump may be the president of the United States in 2025. And how would you like to give him the powers to regulate digital media or any media for that matter? So I don't think that uh, government re direct regulation of what can and cannot or should and shouldn't be said on, in the online world is going to work. The stuff I've heard that makes more sense to me are some transparency standards so that we have a clear idea what their algorithms are doing and to make it possible for individuals or groups like PolitiFact to substitute other kinds of algorithms. So you don't have to accept Facebooks. You can use PolitiFacts, which is going to say, we're going to promote stuff in your feed, which has passed our fact checks. Uh, so the digital media companies currently don't allow that. So some of the standards that have to do with transparency, access, those may make more sense. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm reminded that I think the Philippines has one of the tougher internet regulation laws out there. And uh, so they're cracking down on fake news, but the person at the lever is Duterte, which may not be something, <laughs> may not be something you want. Yeah, Mr. Fake News himself. Yeah, that's, that's right. Liz, you have another question from the group? 
Yeah, sort of a related question from the audience. Should we codify the rules and norms that we've taken for granted for decades to avoid having elected officials abdicate their responsibilities? Too late. The norms are in rubble. Got an entire political party that has uh, that has decided it's comfortable with using tactics like outright denying what the election return showed. So now the question is not codifying norms, it's rebuilding them. And that only happens really when voters decide to stop rewarding the conduct. And this is a difficult problem. You talk about, it's interesting. So within that, I'm going to Tallahassee-based crowd, state capital, uh, politics is on people's minds. You know, I would imagine there are lots of people who don't buy in to the kind of the MAGA right taking over the Republican Party, yet would rather vote for the Republican than the, than the Democrat. And I kind of wonder, this is going a little far afield, but the Constitution of Knowledge, one of the things in this book talks about our system and how would you rather have a different one, you know? And uh, the one thing that I think we may have got ourselves into a little bit is the two-party system and the way we run elections in this country has created options where for the past two presidential cycles, at least, I think there are a lot of Americans who were saying, I don't like either candidate and I'm forced into picking a tribe, but I don't necessarily feel like I'm a part of either. I just want you to react to that. I think I don't, that's not a good question, but <laughs> yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's true. It gets us into the realm of politics, but as you I'm sure both know the number of people who are loyal to either political party has fallen relative to relative to independence. And there's a lot of cynicism out there. And by the way, that cynicism is not accidental. You've had 40 or 50 years long predating Donald Trump or MAGA or cancel culture as we know it or anything else of attacks on American institutions opportunistically from both the, the left and the right. So yes, what you say is undoubtedly true. I think it's still possible even for partisans to make make distinctions. There are still Republicans who are keeping MAGA at a distance, who are willing to say that Joe Biden won the election. And one of those just became governor of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that when people go to the polls, they look at, is this person really trying to, to, to be reality-based? Or are they really collaborating in a campaign to undermine our institutions? Now, I realize people will disagree about that. But if we start taking that seriously and voting on it, I think it'll help. One thing I'll add, uh, Jonathan, to this is uh, people ask me uh, this question, and my answer might shock you. I do not think we should vote for automatically the most honest or truthful candidates. I think it's a criteria we should use, but it, it doesn't have to be the only one. I think that isn't necessarily the the rubric. He's even a fact checker that I'm looking for. But I, I I would have of course agree with that. But I give a pretty heavy weight. Yep. You know, you when you've got candidates and and there are a lot of them now, especially on the Republican side, who will just say anything. Some of them are now in Congress. Then that would be a voting criterion for me. I would say that person does not deserve the trust of a Democratic small D electorate. Liz. So um, I'm going to synopsize maybe four or five questions that are kind of all asking, you know, okay, you know, we're not really a part of the constitution of knowledge in my day job. (laughs) I'm trying to figure out what to do, both checking myself and making sure that I'm not making errors in my judgment. And then also knowing what to do with people I know and love who you know, I, I, I want to, I want to be able to engage with, you know, how can, how can we make this better if you're just an average person and including things like, you know, do we, you know, fa- facts sometimes backfire, right? So if you throw facts at people, a lot of times that just increases their, their defense against them. And then I want to make sure that when somewhere, when you touch on this, John, I wanted you to say something about the line experiment, both the basics of it, and then what happens when you disrupt it by having one person who tells the truth. So those those are two different things, but they do intersect. And it's going to be hard to do this extremely concisely, but I will try. So there are 
two parts to the first part of that question. Part one was, what can I do in my life? And one thing that I think is really helpful for ordinary people trying to sort through it is try to avoid getting stuck in a media ghetto or a bubble where you're only listening to right wing or left wing or whatever. If you're a liberal, read the Wall Street Journal. If you're a conservative, look at the New York Times. But get enough of the other side so that you at least understand the contours of the arguments and do a little bit of disconfirmation. Um, that's hard to do. You know, it, it makes us gnash our teeth. Studies find that people would rather go to the dentist than encounter political views that oppose their own. <laughs> but try. It'll make it. It'll make you healthier, and it'll actually strengthen your your ability to um, understand and argue. So the second part of that is the famous uncle question. This is the person who believes the, the conspiracy theories and has been sucked down a rabbit hole. And what do you say to them? And that's a hard problem to which a lot of attention is now being focused. But it appears that, sorry, Aaron, just peppering them with facts doesn't work. People dig in deeper, they become defensive. And what does seem to help, the most promising thing, is to kind of come up alongside them and show some curiosity, show some empathy, assume that they're not an idiot, and then you can start asking some hard questions like, okay, so you say the election was stolen. How would that have been coordinated among the hundreds of officials in the multiple states who had had to do it? How would that have been kept secret? What would have been, the, how would you have stopped the law enforcement? And you begin asking questions, showing curiosity, and you can begin to draw people out and get them asking questions. Um, there's a wonderful quotation that I, I heard from, it's attributed to Dale Carnegie, which is, you can't make people agree with you, but you can make people want to agree with you. And, and I think that's, that's really wise. Uh, remind me of the second half, the thing you threw in at the end, Liz. Is the line experiment. Oh, yeah. So this goes to why it's so important to unmute yourself and be willing to, when you see canceling go on, buck the consensus. 1951, in a classic psychology experiment replicated many times, a room full of eight people are told they're, they're, they're shown a card and they're asked which of three lines on one part of the card matches the length of the line on the, on the left side of the card. And this is designed to be completely, totally obvious. No one ever gets it wrong. By themselves. But it's super easy when you look at the lines. It is super easy. <laughs> For those who want to Google it, it's the Solomon Ash experiment, A S C H. You can see the card he used. In a room full of eight people, however, seven of them are actors and they all give the identical wrong answer. What does the eighth person, the actual subject, do? In about a third of the cases, they will conform with the crowd despite the obvious evidence of their own eyes. And only 25% of the subjects never conform because they had multiple trials. In other words, only 25% of us actually stand firm against the perceived consensus around us. Well, that's powerful because if you can manipulate the perceived consensus by canceling people who disagree with it, you play with people's brains. It's not just that they're chilled in silence. They think maybe I'm wrong about this because everyone disagrees with me. You don't know that actually everyone agrees with you variant of this experiment done a few years later, exact same thing. One experimental subject, seven actors, six actors give the same wrong answer. One actor gives the right answer. In that case, the experimental subject stops conforming to the wrong answer most of the time. All it takes in that room is one reality outline to make people think, okay, maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe I'm not stupid. Maybe I can say this. And that's why it's so important for each of us in our own worlds, whatever that world may be, to try to do our best to stay fact-based and resist the temptation to dive under the furniture when it looks like some people are imposing a consensus that you think is wrong. And almost always there's someone who's thinking the same thing that you are and, and you find them if you're willing to step out. So I'm going to go ahead and let Aaron, uh, you wrap it up uh, after I say that I do think that I think that we can change the world if enough of us read this book and, and apply it to our lives. Or at least buy this book. <laughs> or, or at least buy this book. 
And and I so appreciate you both being here tonight. Aaron, you um, take us out. Great. Well, I, I, I want to add one thing that struck me as you guys were having that discussion is, so one of the true pleasures of working at PolitiFact, and I haven't been doing it now for 11 years, is we call members of the reality-based community on topics that are very polarizing. So it was Obamacare, it could have been Supreme Court cases or tax policy, where most of the people have their mind made up, right? And what's very cool, and I think what is a good lesson for us, is that I could talk to people who think Obamacare is was the worst piece of legislation ever written, and people who think it is the greatest piece of legislation ever written. And if I ask them factual questions, you would be amazed how often they give the same answers. Not because they it makes them feel any different about Obamacare, but because they truly do care about the facts. And, you know, we, we do talk about this a lot, but, you know, to boil it down, as I always do, is you have your facts, you have your beliefs. And if we can move in a direction from facts t- towards beliefs, great. You know, too often we go the other way, right? We start with our beliefs and we go in search of the facts and the internet will always provide us whatever it is we want. Should go ahead, John. Yeah. I'll, I'll amen to that. I know you're supposed to close it out, but but I just have to add, one of the reasons why the work that Liz and Village Square and groups like Braver Angels are doing is so important. When Braver Angels does workshops, bringing blues and reds together, not to agree on policy or find common ground, but just to hear each other and hear each other's point of view and encounter each other, the single most common reaction when they leave the room is we are not as divided as we've been told, we are not as divided as we've been told. And that's also what all the survey evidence show. People have an exaggerated idea of how different the other side is from them. And just the simple act of informing people, here's what the other side actually believes about this. And seeing that difference reduce itself reduces polarization. So when a group like Village Square brings people together to see that they are not aliens, to see that in many cases they are not unreasonable and that there is more in common there than you believe. It has the same effect that Aaron is talking about. It helps reduce the areas of difference and begin to focus on the things that we can build from. Awesome. That's great. Jonathan Rausch is the author of The Constitution of Knowledge and Defense of Truth. Buy it at your local bookstore. On behalf of the Florida Humanities Council, the Village Square, and our streaming partners, we'd like to thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as we did. So uh, we will see you soon. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hey there, it's Vanessa back with you. Well, personally, I think I enjoyed this program more than they did. I must have, so I'm going with that. You know, I often say on this podcast that I'm on this journey with you. And listen, you guys, it's not just a line. That's exactly how I feel. I got this gig because I knew how to get a podcast out the door, not because I was a subject matter expert on these topics. I'm just a regular human learning and thinking along with the rest of you. And I realize that more and more with every passing program. So now, after a crash course of 48 programs in just a year and a half, I'm less sure about anything, really. But now I'm filled with intrigue instead of confusion or anger. I have been humbled to a huge degree. And you know what? Here's the part I find most surprising. I feel so much happier and calmer this way. Although I do sort of feel like a crazy person when I try to explain this change to other people. It's like, hey, guess what? I know nothing for sure. And it's awesome. I love my new look. Whatever. I have a feeling you guys get it. Anyway, this is why I told Liz recently that we need to change my title to flawed human. And I mean it for real. I'm totally embracing this because it opens up the space to try to be better and know more. And now that the brilliant Jonathan Rausch has told us that we're all flawed, I know I'm an excellent company. All right, before I let you go, I have to tell you, 
I kept chuckling at how many times Jonathan used Aaron as the example of the villain during this program. I'm really hoping Aaron doesn't get accidentally canceled, but if he does, we're all going to have to come to his defense. Are you with me, Squarecasters? We can practice speaking up for someone when it's really easy. All right, that's about it for today's program. Let's hear it for Jonathan Rausch and Aaron Sherrickman. We're so thankful they joined us for this timely and very important program. And of course, a huge thank you goes to Florida Humanities for partnering with us to present this podcast series, Created Equal and Breathing Free. Also, thanks to Bill and Jill Maddox and Spence Davis for helping to make these programs possible through their generous donations. And we thank you as well for being part of this journey with us. To stay up to date with all that's happening at the Village Square, subscribe to our newsletter by visiting our website at villagesquare.us. We appreciate you listening to A Defense of Truth with Jonathan Rausch. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon, and thanks for listening to Village Squarecast. Cast.